Ladies and gentlemen, please take a seat. Dear State Secretary, dear Excellencies, dear delegation from the SKO. So we have here Katrin Cezarski over there. Actually, she chairs the Council of the SKO. We have Director General Phil Diamond sitting over there, we'll have on the panel. And the whole, uh, there are many other people coming from SKO from Manchester. So thanks for coming. Professors, rectors, Dear researchers, we have quite numerous researchers in the room, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure today to have this event in the house of Switzerland, Davos, and we have an audience online. So I would like to invite you now to discover, I would say, something which is unique and you will discover, because probably most of you, what SKO is exactly, you maybe still question it. So the event is called Switzerland Joins the SKO, Fostering Swiss Research and Industry Through Advancement in Radio Astronomy. So it commemorates, actually, that Switzerland just signed and joined the founding members of SKO on 19 January 2022. My name is Olivier Küttel, I'm Head of International Affairs at EPFL, and uh, we start actually, and I would give you an overview of the menu of today. So the menu of this afternoon is a welcome speech first by uh, Swiss State Secretary uh, Martina Hirayama. Then actually, if you wonder what SKO is all about, we am pleased to have Katrin Cesarski, who actually will introduce you in a, in a keynote speech for t of 10 minutes, what is SKO? And the main course of today, it's actually a panel discussion with many panelists, I will introduce later on, to just see what's in for Switzerland, why it's important for astrophysics, why it's important for the world. With this, I hand over now to State Secretary Martina Hirayama. You are, since the 1st of January 2019, you are heading actually what is called the Swiss State Secretary for Education, Research and Innovation. It's part of the Department of Economic Affairs, Research and Innovation. So the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Dear Council Chair, um, Mrs. Cesarski, uh, dear Director General, Mr. Diamond, it's a pleasure to be here today, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the in invitation to celebrate Switzerland's accession to the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, SKAO. Since the physical event was not uh, possible on January 19th this year, the day Switzerland became a full member of SKAO, it is a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today. The Square Kilometer Array, the world's most sensitive radio telescope, is an outstanding project. It is expected to deliver revolutionary discoveries about uh, the history of the universe, primarily relating to the formation and development of the first stars and galaxies. The accession of Switzerland to SKAO was an important milestone for Switzerland as well as for SKAO, as Switzerland was the first non-signatory country of the convention to become SKAO member. Great challenges lie ahead of us, but I trust we will be able to overcome them. I'm convinced that SKA will achieve breakthrough results which will allow us to expand the boundaries of our knowledge. This membership will strengthen Swiss research in the field of radio astronomy at the international level and will be an important driver for international research collaboration in this sense, this membership is fully in line with uh, the 
International Strategy for Education, Research and Innovation of Switzerland, which aims to strengthen and extend Switzerland's international scientific research network. The strategy provides that uh, Swiss uh, ARI stakeholders enjoy full access uh, to leading research infrastructures such as SKA. After all, science uh, and research thrive on international cooperation and exchange. Only then excellence can be achieved. Switzerland is willing now and in the future to contribute to our common goal of strong, fruitful cross-border collaboration in research and innovation in general and in the field of radio astronomy in this specific case. Swiss scientists will participate in research in several fundamental areas within radio astronomy, including the study of uh, exoplanets and cosmology. Swiss industry will contribute to the development of data processing systems, radio receivers and digitizers, and of course, precise time management. What else in Switzerland? And this special day, I'm particularly pleased to, to welcome the Director General of SKAO and uh, the Chair Council of SKAO. I also seize the opportunity to convey my gratitude to EPFL for organizing this event, uh, and I wish you all a great and interesting exchange. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to introduce Catherine Cesarski, and I need to. I will. I will be short, but I need to introduce her. So, I mean, you are yourself astrophysicist. She has more than 150 refereed paper. I would, if you allow, Catherine, I call you la grande dame of astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing what she has done. So, just let me state two things here. So, she has been the director general of ESO. In, from 1999 to 2007, actually, a period which was very important for ESO. So you were director general. You have been working for the French government in the High Commission as High Commission commis mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner, still advising the French government on issues like science and, and energy, astrophysics, energy. energy mostly. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. It's a great pleasure to listen what is SKO. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, talk about SKAO. So SKAO will observe the universe in the radio range. You know, to understand the universe, we need to look at it in all the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum from the high energetic gamma rays to the ultraviolet, uh, the X-rays, ultraviolet, optical, etc., and then Submillimeter, millimeter, submillimeter, and eventually radio from one end to the other. And all of this data together will allow us to see what has happened. But I want to say from the start that radio is perhaps the richest of all these domains because perhaps almost any phenomena associated with what happens in the universe also emits radio waves sometimes at a very faint level, and therefore you need very sensitive equipment to be able to detect it, but there's always something to learn from radio. So for this reason, it was decided that it was important to have an extremely sensitive facility to work in the radio range, and it was decided to call it SKA, and a global collaboration was established between 16 countries to uh, construct and operate what will be this most important uh, radio observatory. And the new intergovernmental organization has been created, we just heard about it. Um, and you know that uh, uh, part of the frequencies, the low frequencies will be observed from, um, the, from a place in uh, Australia and the high frequency ones will be observed from South Africa. So it means a uh, meter wave uh, more or less a meter wavelengths for centimeters or tens of centimeters wavelengths. So it's one observatory, but in fact, uh, two telescopes 
and the headquarters are in England, so you have these three founding countries, and then you have the 16 other countries, of which eight are now complete members, and of course they put a big star to the newest one, Switzerland. So, what is it that we want to do science? And as I said, extremely wide range of science, so I just listed some of the points. One has to do with uh, beginnings of life and astrobiology, and the other has to do with testing gravity, with very dense objects in the universe, black holes and neutron stars. Um, then there is the whole question of how the universe came to be as it is, with a special structure uh, looking like a big macrame with long filaments of matter and uh, lots of uh, galaxies getting together at the places where the filaments meet. And in there, you have the galaxies and the stars, and how did all this form? What is the role of the magnetism in all of this? How is the galactic evolution uh, through all the life of the universe? And this can be proved particularly well in the radio because uh, most of the gas is hydrogen, the matter is hydrogen, and the hydrogen emits can be observed in the radio uh, because it emits a line, a special line, in neutral hydrogen, and even the ionized uh, uh, hydrogen can be observed in the radio continuum, so many ways of observing it. We can try to observe also the very early times of uh, formation in the universe, what we call cosmic dawn, because with a very sensitive instrument you can go very far in time, and we can address important questions of cosmology and dark energy, and also study variable sources. So I just want to illustrate it quickly with examples having to do with existing facilities and what we can do with the SKA. So when, where do Earth-like planets form in disks? So with ALMA, which is a submillimeter and millimeter facility of the same kind of SKA but at shorter wavelengths, it's been possible to observe disks in which planets form. And when a planet forms, it cleans all the dust that is in this region to get back there. But what, to understand the way planets form, we really need to understand what happens when grains have centimeters and more. And this cannot be done there, but will be done with SKA. Now we make models, but one day we will see whether our models are right. It's also important to understand where does life come from. And looking at them, in the, again, in the millimeter wavelength range, it's been possible to find uh, molecules that are organic molecules close to what is needed for life. Now we want to know if in interstellar space there are also more complicated molecules or whether those in the end were really formed on Earth. And this can only be done with a very sensitive instrument like SKA and at the wavelength range of SKA where complicated organic molecules, which are bricks of life, I would say, uh, are formed and emit uh, signatures that we will be able to detect. Then we, as I said, want to understand the formation of uh, stars and eventually galaxies and the role of magnetic fields. And really, it's in the radio range that you have several methods of measuring magnetic fields. And an example is this figure, which is the same that was shown before, which was done by a precursor of SKA, um, MIRCAT, which is in South Africa and will be integrated in SKA. And you see that this is the radio image of it, and you see all these lines. It's also full of filaments. So again, you have a filamentary structure here at a much lower level. And these filaments actually are magnetic field lines which become luminous because they contain extremely fast electrons which emit synchrotron radiation. In the same, uh, if we now go again to the idea of filaments but on an extremely large scale, then we go to very large objects, which are clusters of galaxies. So in the optical, you would see here many galaxies, but in the radio, what you see is what you see here in blue, a general emission from the whole area. And very interestingly, there is an emission in between. And so this is already a filament uh, relating these two clusters, and we need to understand why it's luminous, and for this, we need more sensitivity and more angular resolution than can be obtained at the moment, and again, we need SKA. Um, 
As I said, uh, we can measure neutral hydrogen with this 21 centimeter line. At the moment, we can do things like that. We make detailed models, which you can see have many more features. And to be able to compare this with reality, again, we need SKA. Um, we can also observe now the details of what happens with neutral hydrogen moving between the closest galaxy to us, the Magellanic Cloud, and uh, our galaxy. But we want to be able to do things like that with also galaxies far away. Again, only SKA will be able to do that. And uh, we can also uh, try to understand why the galaxies have in their center massive black holes of millions of times the mass of the sun. And uh, so this is an, the optical image is black. So here are, for instance, two black holes. And we think that the, the way these black holes grow and become very big may be because they merge. And we need to understand this merging process. And radio is, again, teaching is a lot. So the green are radio data, which shows that there is a lot of expulsion of matter and fast particles from these two objects. And uh, whether this is showing that they will merge or where it's post-merger, whether it's uh, uh, much pre-merger is something to be studied. There's another example below, which I don't have time to explain. So in conclusion, not only uh, is the radio range unique in its universality, but with SKA, we will have the largest range of scales of any facility, the largest range of time scales from the first stars to now, the largest range of spectral diagnostics, and uh, which I won't name, but many, many. And uh, very interestingly, what we will get out of it will a lot have to do with the way the data are being reduced. So it will be a tool to progress all the time in very point uh, complicated uh, data reduction techniques. And from the same data, we will get more and more through the years because of this. And this, I think, will help in many other subjects as well. And finally, uh, it's a new way to look at the sky because it can have a very large field of view and then can take on, uh, you can take the parts that you really want. And uh, you can also have high resolution and mapping speed. So I think it's the ultimate multi-wavelength observer. And finally, I wanted to mention that I've just talked about the science, but there is also the impact of SKA in other things, non-science non impact. And we considered that it was a critical part of SKA case and at the workshop that took place in 2010. And so the group uh, of SKA have uh, very diligently uh, developed a case uh, about in the foundational documents describing all resources and activities involved in uh, establishment and delivery of SKAO and construction of SKA. So I just show you all the part on impacts. Obviously, I'm not going to read it, but just to say that in addition to the science, they will be uh, read astronomy as a driver of innovation. And there is the impact, of course, on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, impact on economy, on innovation, spin-offs, building capabilities in industry, responding to societal emergencies, inspiring the next generation in school programs and all. Um, and uh, in, from the environmental point of view, we'll try to use as much of renewable energy as possible, not just for the telescopes, but also for the computing facilities. So uh, thank you very much. I hope with this you get a quick view of SKO. SKO. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm convinced there's probably still some questions. On, uh, so thanks a lot for the, you know, this presentation, which ask, you know, probably a lot of people have questions. So please keep it maybe for the end. Uh, then uh, we have maybe have some time to do As you wish. Yeah, some of the Q&A. Just one question. Yeah. <laughs> When do we have the first light of SKO? It's not a completely first light because as pieces will be ready, they will be a commissioning that will already give a taste for the kind of data that we will get. So our construction will take something like 2028, 2029. But uh, you know, it's not like a telescope uh, where you because it's built pieces by pieces. So some pieces will be 
tested before, and uh, yep. even if construction is stopped, it starts at 2020, is uh, finished at 2029, there will be some things yep. to look at before. Mm -hmm. And actually, maybe some, one of the questions you, you might have, and I will ask uh, later but on, that will feel diamond, yes, is actually, it's, it's an interesting constella constellation when you look on the countries involved. It's not the usual suspects, I would say. So, Phil, I will ask you then later on, because it started in South Africa in, no. and Australia. No, 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 it started in, in America and Europe. <laughs> okay. But Phil will Sorry. talk about but it. But Phil, you will you think about it, because actually we have been to South Africa, we have seen some of the uh, uh, installation, which is already there. We know that South Africa is very much involved, so maybe then, uh, uh, you know, you can then uh, explain a little bit. So we are just now rebuilding the scene here to put tables and, and chairs, and then I will invite the panelists to come. So maybe, uh, Catherine. Yes, I go back and sit. Thank you very much, and I'm ready for questions at the end, if you wish. <coughs> so and while actually uh, they're putting now the, uh, the, the, you know, the panel together, so let me introduce maybe the panelists. So you have already seen uh, Catherine Cesarski. We will have as well State, uh, Swiss State Secretary Martina Hirayama on the panel. Then we have Phil Diamond. So Phil Diamond is actually the Director General of, of SKO. You are yourself an astrophysicist. You are a professor at the University of Manchester. And actually, as a CEO, it's your responsibility that this telescope will be constructed, right? So it's, it's a quite a, uh, and you know, you will explain us a little bit about the timeline. But so, welcome here in, in the House of Switzerland in Davos. Then we have Martin Fetterli sitting here in, in front. So Marta Fettel is the president of EPFL. And actually, Marta, if you allow, so he's my boss as well, so I have to say that, right? So I have to be careful what I'm uh, saying now, but it's interesting because Marta, at, as a president of EPFL, and EPFL played an important role here, you know, to get Switzerland into SKO. However, Marta Fettel has an interest as a researcher as well. So his lab on, on audiovisual communication, so you developed some algorithm, still when you had time to do research. I don't know uh, how it's looking uh, today. But so actually there's an interest as well uh, for Martin, you know, from the science point of view. Then we have Jean-Paul Kneipp. So maybe you, you can come up now, so the, the, the panel is prepared. So Martin, uh, Swiss State, uh, State Secretary, please, Catherine. Jean-Paul, please come up. So Jean-Paul is professor in astrophysics at EPFL. Please come up and just take whatever seat you want. So Jean-Paul Kneipp is actually I would say, uh, so he's first of all the professor of, of, on astrophysics at EPFL. He's the director of the eSpace Center, and actually he's the leading person for bringing Switzerland. So he coordinated a lot of the efforts and, you know, to bring Switzerland into SKO. And then we have Michel Hüpner. Michel, where are you? Over there. So please come on stage. So Michel is, I would call, this, this, it, well, it's the Swiss liaison officer for industry. So what does it mean? Actually, for the big uh, infrastructures, in Switzerland is participating when it comes to research. So what Michel is doing is to make sure that Swiss industry have a return on, on actually on the big in, uh, research infrastructure. And today, you are representing the liaison officer for Swiss industry, actually, for SKO. So thanks for being here. So let me start. Uh, with you, Martina Hirayama, you presented, you know, from the Swiss secret, uh, state secretary why this is important. Now, what made, because, you know, you have a long list of possible research infrastructure, you know, researchers are quite creative coming up with, you know, which Switzerland should join this or that. So, what was the decisive kind of moment where you said, you know, it would make sense that Switzerland joins SKO? Maybe. It's on? Yeah. So, <laughs> so actually, uh, we prepare for every uh, area dispatch, dispatch, the financing dispatch for education, research, and innovation in Switzerland, which we prepare every four years. We prepare a so-called uh, roadmap. And uh, in this roadmap, uh, the universities, uh, yes, uh, decide about the important uh, infrastructure for the next period and this is very important uh, for us because uh, 
the universities, with uh, the faculties, uh, the professors, uh, they are the experts and uh, they have to evaluate and uh, at the end also uh, there's an uh, evaluation by the Swiss uh, National Science Foundation and on this uh, basis uh, we uh, decide on the infrastructure. But, uh, you know, this does not mean that all uh, infrastructure on the roadmap uh, is financed uh, by federal finances. It can also be that it's financed uh, by the universities itself, but uh, it helps them to know <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it, I have to admit the, the speed you know, from the time you were starting to discuss on, you know, possible accession of Switzerland until we got it, you know, through federal council. So there, there was a dispatch that you had to write and to federal council, parliament. It was impressive. So what's, what's the secret? Why? Because it's not always like this, right? We agree on, on so this time it was, um, for SKO, it was really quick. Uh, why that? What's the secret? What's... So, um, actually, the secret is that in the last airy dispatch uh, for the years 21 to 24, we also, we already mentioned that uh, Switzerland is evaluating to be member uh, at SKAO. We already um, uh, funded uh, the participation, even not being member uh, for the years uh, 21 to 24. And then when the decision was taken, it was about the additional funding uh, till uh, 2030. But everything actually was in place, it was announced, so we could uh, directly prepare the dispatch then uh, uh, for the membership and uh, for the financing to the year 2030. And of course, I mean, it's an exciting infrastructure to be member. It's very important uh, for the research community. It was not so difficult to, s to show this in the dispatch. It's interesting for industry because they can participate in constructing. And of course, it's always a possibility to boost the yeah. innovation in Switzerland, also for technologies uh, which can be used then uh, in, in other areas. Yeah. So, I mean, you're just mentioning industry. So maybe let's, let's ask Michel. So Michel, you are the liaison officer for Swiss industry. So apparently there's something in for Swiss industry here. So what, what is it? Can you explain and, and uh, who is involved and you know, what are they contributing? Is it for the construction, the operation? Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so um, there, there is a good match, uh, big science um, market uh, to, wi to which SKO belongs uh, fits well to the to the Swiss industry in the sense that uh, uh, this sector, this industry sector, we're speaking about the SMEs, uh, is, is is very um, is very project oriented, is, is very customer oriented. Um, this sector provides uh, yeah, world-class uh, engineering solutions, uh, uh, export, they are, they are com compatible with, with export markets. So it, and, and of course, there's a long-standing experience with, with further uh, research uh, programs in Europe, like, like CERN, like ESA, like JET. Uh, so that, that makes, uh, that makes this, this industry culture in, in, in Switzerland uh, very capable and, and offering uh, yeah, great, uh, great technologies to, to, to the demand. Uh, uh, of, of SK, for, for, for example, uh, um, and maybe I can give some some yeah, some, some examples. Yeah, I mean, we we we've been. I think the level of confidence is now quite high with the atomic clocks at SK. Uh, well, I as you said that in your introduction, uh, Swiss um, uh, Swiss um, time management devices uh, is an in, in indisputable asset in in Switzerland. Uh, the, s the Swiss timing works. <laughs> Yes. And and here here also at um, I mean at SKA you have to you have to synchronize the signals to uh, f uh, f collected from the different antennas at a very precise uh, timing level and and so so um, I, I, I can say that this um, in front of I mean I can say it publicly that that this this uh, one of the first contracts is is is, uh, is acquired now um, and, and to to SKO then maybe an. Uh, Another example, can I, can I go ahead? Uh, I find it very interesting. This is another technology um, on, on the radio receiver side. So there is a spin-off from ATHZ, uh, which uh, optimizes and, and is specialized in um, ultra-low um, 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 
low level um, electronics, ultra low noise uh, um, electronics, and um, and they, they have um, they have devel developed their, their own semiconductor uh, technology. So they're growing their they're growing their their own semiconductor here in Switzerland. They're, they're in Canton Zug. So. Uh, view on the lake, view on the mountains, as, as it should be. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but no, sorry. More important is that that they um, um, they have already references in the radio astronomy domain, in in, uh, in other uh, radio astronomy pro programs in the U.S. and, and others in, in Europe. So, uh, well, the, the the project is not as mature as with the atomic clocks, but. Uh, again, if, if, if we build a, an infrastructure which costs one or two billions, you, you want the best detector. You want, y y you know, you, you just want, and you would, you would take the superior uh, um, technology available. So, so there's other players, we have competition, yep. but I believe um, we, we are latecomers to the program, as, you, as we all know. Uh, so the, the there's other players on, on, on the road, where, but, but, um, um, but again, um, I think with, with upgrades or with, uh, with new frequency bands, uh, which will be open for, for the SK pro program later on, I think this, this technology is, is very relevant. Well, thank you. Looking forward. But maybe it brings me to, to Phil, actually. Can you explain us so what's the timeline, where do we are in the construction, uh, you know, what was decided? And then I will come back to the questions where I probably put it wrong on the beginning on South Africa, the world, and Australia. So please, Phil. So with, with regard to the timeline, um, we have formally started what we call construction activities. So the SK Observatory Council um, gave us permission to proceed. They, they, they were confident in our program. Um, they, they felt uh, enough funds had been identified for the observatory to proceed to construction. Uh, and that was uh, at the 1st of July of last year. So uh, at the moment, uh, we, we have let 38 contracts, which is about half of the, the number of contracts which will be let, totaling of order 145 million euros, I believe. Maybe you could feel, can you say what's the budget of, of SA so or what are we speaking So about? the construction budget is about 1.3 billion euros. And then the operating budget for the first 10 years, we're actually spending operating money now. My, my salary comes out of operating money. Um, that that uh, is about 650 million. Uh, over the, the reason why it's so oh, high, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wish. I wish. That's yeah. That's uh, over the. Uh, I would change job. There, yeah. Yes. Uh. Anyway, so a total of about two billion euros for the first ten years. Um, we uh, expect uh, to have the uh, the bulldozers uh, start on putting the infrastructure in place, roads, power, buildings in the third quarter of this year. Uh, so there's a lot of software being written now, but the big infrastructure contracts, uh, we're in the tendering phase, uh, and they're, they're, they're being uh, look, looked at pretty much as we speak. Yeah. Because, Phil, maybe just a question on, on, on the sites. Maybe we have to explain to the audience as well that actually finding and identifying sites there were some strong requirements, so maybe you can elaborate Ab on that. Absolutely. So that, that was a multi-year process that um, actually culminated in 2012. So the sites were decided about 10 years ago. Um, but a, a key requirement was radio quietness. Um, because as uh, Catherine indicated, we're, we're building the most sensitive radio telescope in the world. Um, if, if we put it close, close to where people live, with all of our electronic devices, with the, you know, the, the electronic noise that the modern world generates, we would interfere so much with the telescope that it would severely limit our ability to observe the universe. So radio quietness was the key element. And in fact, both Australia and South Africa, their governments have, uh, by, have, have legislation creating huge radio quiet zones uh, around where the, the radio telescopes are for which we're very grateful. That, that so it's part of the Karoo Desert, right, in South Africa? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's semi-arid. Um, yeah. It's not full desert, but it's, it's semi-arid in both cases. Uh, and in Western Australia, it's a very extremely low population density. The, uh, the area there, the, the, the shire, the county in which SKA is populated, is the size of the Netherlands. And I heard, I was in Australia just last week, uh, the population has recently increased from 154 to 157 as uh, <laughs> um, new babies have, uh, have, have come along. 
So that that's the population there. In South Africa, it's a little... But they have to learn to live without mobile phones, right? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. We, the, the thing is, it's not, um, uh, it, it's not particularly economic for the mobile phone companies to put signals out there. So they're, they're heavily reliant upon the internet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're very remote regions of the world. Of Maybe the just a, a, a few words on, on, on the importance of the two sites, the countries, South Africa and Australia. So, you know, because I know South Africa, it's quite important project for the country as well. Uh, <coughs> yes, in, in fact, um, within South Africa, so post-apartheid, um, the, the government uh, were looking at what, the, uh, uh, what, what, what their future might be, and, th and they decided that they wanted to, to change from a, a primar primarily agrarian economy to a, a knowledge-based, knowledge-driven economy. Uh, and actually, Rob Adam, who is currently the director of the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, was the director general within uh, the Department of uh, Science, I think the equivalent position to the state secretary yeah. there. Um, and he put, to, he, he looked, he identified with a team, obviously, 13 areas of science in which South Africa would put its, its limited funds. And astronomy was one of them because they, 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 they call it the, uh, the astronomy advantage. They, uh, with with this, these remote areas of the world, uh, low population densities in some areas, they recognized they had an advantage. They were in the southern hemisphere, so this galactic uh, plane you see on the, the wall behind is, is right overhead. So various advantages that they saw, yep. and they, they put themselves forward as a, as a site uh, to host the SKA, uh, and, and of course they and Australia were selected. Yep. Maybe, uh, Marta Fittoli, actually you visited the site in, in South Africa, and I know you were impressed. <laughs> Can you tell us why? Well, I figured if we could do research in such a beautiful environment, you know, it would be worth uh, joining the, the effort. Uh, so, so yeah, I visited the Meerkat actually with, uh, uh, on a visit with your predecessor, Martina, uh, a few, what was it, 2016 or something? 16 or 17, uh, 17. And um, uh, so it was very impressive. It was also impressive to see a country like South Africa, you know, investing in this and being very forward-looking and risk-taking, actually, because it wasn't obvious at all, and it's still not obvious for a country uh, like South Africa to, you know, take the, the risk of doing fairly fundamental science and, and you know, uh, involving their people. Uh, I was very impressed by the people they had in, in South Africa, also the people that joined, actually, the team. Um, and so uh, I thought that was a cool project. Um, also because of the magnitude of the project, also because it's a new way to do radio astronomy. So by total coincidence, I, I, I had uh, a couple of members of my team who were working on, on another radio astronomy project together with a three-letter company that shall remain unnamed here because I'm not doing any publicity. Uh, and, and because of that, we sort of knew about the problem, right? And uh, Olivier, you, ma you mentioned that, you know, that was one of my interests. But the other one I have to say is, as uh, the job I have now, which is super interesting because you see all different fields of sciences, right? And so uh, my interest, I'm a methods guy, I do essentially applied math, is to look in different areas of science if there is methods from one area that could actually be transferred to, the, to another area and you know, speed up the creation of knowledge, right? Because this doesn't always happen at the speed it should because you know, academia likes silos and communities and so on. And so it's super important to identify when new methods are available and can really have an impact across many fields of sciences. And of course, the methods I'm speaking about, you, you, you can guess, is you know, data science and AI, which will have a tremendous impact also on radio astronomy uh, in you know, uh, improving detection, improving modeling, you know, seeing things which uh, maybe you, you wouldn't see with traditional methods. And um, there I'm thinking, you know, th you, you all have seen the first image of a black hole, uh, which was done by also an interdisciplinary team, an international team, and that was very much one that was based on state-of-the-art, you know, new methods in data science. And, um, so in, and I'm also, also extremely happy and grateful to Martina that we joined the SKA all, 
even if she, if you listen to her carefully, she said the bill would come to me, right? Yeah. That's what you meant. Uh, so, no jokes aside. Um, so, EPFL is very much involved in an in initiative we have had now for five years, which is called the Swiss Data Science Center, which we run together with ETH in Zurich, and which is providing data science and AI know-how with specialists, about 40 people, to help essentially any area of science that has data and wants to generate knowledge, okay? Because different fields have different levels of maturity there. And uh, the SDSC is going to have a pillar on uh, essentially astronomy and therefore radio astronomy. I'm sure we are going to be involved very heavily in the exploitation of the data that is going to be generated by this extremely uh, intriguing and powerful new infrastructure. Thanks, Martin. Now, maybe, I mean, it was mentioned, you just mentioned the data science. So, Jean-Paul, can you, can you help us? So, because we were speaking about astrophysics, apparently we're going to create a lot of data. So, can you just tell us, so, how much data, how does it compare? Is it a challenge? Is it solved? So, what do we are here? Yeah, I mean, we, we could see SKAO as a very special research instrument in the sense that it will deliver data in such a big way compared to what we have today, at least in astrophysics, which will really, you know, be a game changer. I mean, to give you an order of magnitude, it will produce about 700 petabytes a year, which is roughly 10 times what CERN is dealing today as a you know, volume of data. Uh, of course, computer will increase in power, and so by the time you know the telescope here are working, I don't think you know should be too much of a problem. But still, I mean, it's such a big data set. We have to think things a bit differently in the way we analyze the data. And um, and so, in Switzerland in particular, there's a number of teams uh, that some of them are here on the table here uh, in the audience that are already working on trying to make this game changer in the way we look at the data using different techniques, uh, improved techniques like uh, the one that Martin mentioned, but also looking at how you do the computation on your computer, rather you know, using GPU accelerators rather than normal CPUs, um, just you know, trying to rethink also how you do things, uh, adjusting also the way uh, you build the computer that will be needed for the for the data crunching. So there's a lot of work that here in Switzerland we're very well placed to do. Uh, Jean-Paul, just because you were very helpful in organizing the Swiss community, uh, the co Swiss community, and part of the community is here, as you just said. So can you just highlight? Because sure, we had heard now uh, data science, but can you highlight some of the competences we have actually you have a project which is actually funded by the Swiss state secretary you know to get Switzerland most out of uh, its participation so what how, how you know what are the the elements actually we are bringing in as Switzerland here on yeah. the academic side now right there, there's different elements there is of course you know the astrophysics side um, and we have a program uh, funded by the Swiss national funds uh, to have the community getting involved onto radio astronomy project. Um, we have also support from SERI for developing the infrastructure, the technology uh, to be part of the SKO project. And this is both in terms of you know, um, software development, uh, instrument development for the future, um, but also thinking of the infrastructure that we will be needed to digest the data. And as, as I said before, you know, it will be really you know, a change gamer in terms of the volume of data, so we have to get ready. So there's all these you know, kind of various activities uh, that we are working on all together. Um, so how many institutions are involved in Switzerland? And so how many people, so, so to give a kind you know, yeah, so of figures? There's basically nine institutions uh, across Switzerland uh, from the, you know, French part to the <laughs> German part, or even in Italy, uh, in Italian part with the national. Don't don't put the, the Ticino in Italy. <laughs> 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 so it's really like a, you know a con concerted and you know cooperation across Switzerland uh, that's you know working all together. Um, 
you mentioned how many are we? I, I don't have a good, I mean, the exact number, but we started very small, you know, with like, you know, 10 professors around the table thinking, oh gosh, you know, this is a, this is a great opportunity for science in the future and we have to be part of that. And I think today the, the SKO community in Switzerland is probably around 70%. Yeah, thanks. Catherine, I mean, you are chair now of the council. Yes. And we have seen some countries, Switzerland being the latest kid on the block. Now, what, who are the next candidates joining SKO? Well, I am happy to say that it's likely that the next one will be France. <laughs> I don't know whether Phil Or maybe Phil, really you me. can comment as no, well. No, 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 but it's okay. But it's, it's really indeed more for Phil to say. And I think probably the next one will be France. With France, we have really agreed on everything. And the agreement has been even deposited at the uh, French embassy in London so that it can be really... Before they uh, change the government. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, the government hasn't changed <laughs> very much. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> therefore, uh, and uh, so after that, uh, there is a, a procedure which can be more or less lengthy. Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing is that the person with whom this agreement was signed, who was the French uh, ambassador in London, uh, is the person who now has become the French Minister of uh, um, International Affairs, I would say. Uh, so uh, she will be exactly in the right place to ensure that uh, all the extra steps that have to be taken, which are purely administrative, are taken fast enough. So I hope that she will help because yeah. she signed with great enthusiasm. Uh, so I would say that's the next. Uh, otherwise, I think I would prefer if you... Yeah, answer Phil, maybe, ca can you comment? I think so it's because more for we have seen, you know, those having for, signed that now there are some, you know, in negotiation. Yes. Sure. Th um, so, so Catherine is exactly right to call out France. And we're, we're very grateful Spain. that the, the, the French government have um, advanced to this stage. Uh, Spain is uh, very closely following on, on the heels of France. Uh, and so it, it's going through the processes within the French government. Um, uh, our colleagues in Germany, um, we, we, we have an accession agreement that uh, looks, we, we're happy with in principle. Uh, that is being uh, consulted, um, the, uh, consultations are happening within the German government to, to make sure everything is, uh, is, is on track with that. Uh, and then we hope Germany will move to that next stage. And similarly, um, in Canada, India, and Sweden, uh, processes are, are moving uh, at, at some pace. We, we have signed what we call interim cooperation agreements uh, with institutes in, in, in many of those countries, as indeed we did uh, with EPFL. So EP, EP EPFL EPFL was the blueprint, right? Yeah, in yes, fact, absolutely. literally, <laughs> literally that, that agreement yes. is the blueprint we are using for yes. these other uh, countries. Absolutely. So, so actually, yeah. you need to discuss with me, Martina Hirayama and put her in contact with those other countries. How now, you know, to have a quick process to get <laughs> it through <laughs> Parliament and get the money, right? If, if I may <laughs> say, um, three or four years ago, uh, uh, Martina's uh, colleagues from, uh, from Surrey uh, came to the SKA um, board, as it was then, the previous governance structure, and they laid out a timetable. And I think I'm correct. I'm looking for my colleague Simon Berry at the back. They laid out a timetable and delivered to that timetable. It was truly impressive and a fantastic example of time management, as, uh, as has been indicated. <laughs> uh, yes. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we turn to the audience. I mean, it's, it's, you have a distinguished uh, panel and uh, please uh, just so maybe you just say you your name and then uh, ask maybe it's a general question then then we'll see how answers or you address directly to a person please hi everyone my name is marga walsoler i am with uh, jesna the geneva science and diplomacy anticipator uh, and i also i just joined the science and diplomacy task force uh, of sko so i'm really excited to um, learn much more about it than I knew just yesterday, so thank you. My question is on uh, this last point of the diplomatic um, dynamics and, the, and the, the access from other countries to SKO. 
Um, we've seen that many other uh, big research infrastructures for the first time uh, have taken some uh, now steps and, and, and stances uh, due to the, the, the conflict in, in Ukraine. So for example, CERN has suspended the observer status of Russia and also the space station and many others. So I would like to ask you, uh, how do you see um, this dynamic uh, impacting uh, SKO at all? And also, uh, if this could be an organization that does continue to keep the scientific community together despite this uh, growing geopolitical uh, and, and, and uh, tension and challenges that we're facing and how science and astronomy and astrophysics can, can be perhaps the, the unifying uh, uh, element. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. So, please. Maybe I can start and hand over for the specific uh, situation concerning uh, SKO. Uh, of course, uh, in uh, science policy, it's always very important to see where the added value um, of a membership is for the research community and uh, for the industry, uh, in our case for Switzerland, of course. And uh, looking at our portfolio, of course, we see that we have uh, synergies uh, with uh, ESO, with ESA, uh, and uh, as well with CERN. Uh, Martin Fetterly mentioned uh, the question of uh, data and uh, there is a cooperation as well with CERN. So we always have a look at the, at, at the situation in uh, science innovation concerning uh, all the different actors uh, in Switzerland. And of course uh, in science diplomacy, which is a very important uh, point for us uh, as well, it, it really depends on the specific uh, situation. Yes, uh, in, in CERN there are still uh, talks going on about the situation, but with ISS, the situation is different. Nothing changed. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia is uh, uh, still uh, involved. And uh, it also, it's, it, it depends uh, on each uh, research organization in what way Russia is involved. And it depends on the member states because the member states uh, sometimes have a quite uh, open uh, poli uh, policies, others not. So from the Swiss side, we are quite open because we say, it's important to build bridges also for the future, also to Russia. And, uh, and research and innovation usually are good uh, to build these bridges because usually they are not very political topics. And uh, so this is why we are involved in yeah. <laughs> quite uh, heavy discussions. But uh, concerning SK, I cannot answer. I have to hand this. Maybe who wants to come? Well, we. As you know, Russia is not in SKA, so we didn't have to consider this question. Um, I want to reiterate, remember that in the case of CERN, uh, Russia was just an observer. At the time when CERN had become, wanted to increase, and at the time, I must say, I was in CERN Council, I was even was vice president of CERN Council, when we discussed all of this and we decided that CERN needed to be bigger and decided to ask many countries that were working with it already to become associates. And the answer of Russia was, we have a very big laboratory of our own, so we don't want to be associates of CERN. We just want to exchange between your laboratory and ours. So you send observers to, to my place and we send observers to yours. So that this was the agreement. And therefore, it's a very specific and simple situation where it was relatively easy to say, okay, we don't want an observer anymore. You know, they didn't have, and also we will not observe for a while. But I would say if, uh, um, suppose Russia had signed with SKA, this is a treaty organization. You know, it's at the level of the government. So it's not for the other members to decide that one member who has signed the treaty cannot anymore be there. I just can't imagine how we could have achieved that. I completely agree with, of course, what your Secretary of State said. I think if Russia had been a member, it would continue being a member. There is nothing we could do about it. I mean, maybe just because, I mean, thanks for the question I had it. Some of you know, is what's the relation between this project and diplomacy, science for diplomacy? I mean, the big elephant in the room might be China, right? As well, I mean, it's member. Uh, those having read the press over the last days. Uh, I yes. mean, uh, and you know, all of us are questioning, you know, so can we use such project to build bridges instead of, you know, 
cutting down relations. So I don't know, maybe you... I, I, I think the, the building bridges aspect of it, and I, I know Margaret is, is very interested in, in such things. I, I think that that's a critical role for intergovernmental intergovernmental organizations such as ours. Um, and actually, I, I think back to, I mean, it was when I, when I was a, uh, a young boy even, uh, but you know, thinking about the history uh, of radio astronomy in the Cold War, it was uh, used as one of the tools to actually build bridges uh, between scientists on either side of the Iron Curtain. Yeah. And okay, it was a small element in that, there were much bigger uh, elements, but nevertheless, it was very useful. Uh, and in fact, um, I, think, I think it's true to say that some of the first um, significant scientific exchanges of people happened in the world of radio astronomy as we used the, as the, using the technique called very long baseline interferometry, which is that same technique that sh uh, produced the picture of the, of the black hole uh, uh, in the last couple of years, the very recent one as well. And it's very similar to technique to that that we yep. use in SKA. So you know, get, getting radio telescopes to point at the same objects at the same time and record the data in the same format requires communication. And it was a very useful element in that whole process. And so I, I see, um, I, I think the, our, our governments, the mem member governments, uh, do, do see having that relationship uh, on the scientific level where we don't bring politics into the observatory, yeah. as at yeah. least we don't. Um, and I, I think they find that extremely useful. Okay. I'll, I'll talk as a scientist. Uh, since I was born on the day that Sputnik was launched, I might be a little bit biased on that one, but uh, uh, so <laughs> no more seriously. Uh, I also, <laughs> given my old age, I also participated in, uh, I just gave it away, right? Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I also participated in one of the last NATO conference uh, that were uh, organized during the Cold War to keep bridges between, uh, you know, Eastern science, Eastern European science, Soviet science, and uh, the Western science. And, you know, NATO was organizing this because these were some of the last channels to actually communicate, right? And uh, my message is a little bit, and I'm talking under the control of the state secretary, but, you know, you know, it's not a good idea to burn bridges because these are very hard to rebuild. So the bridges we have, if possible, we should actually maintain. Well, I, I never just wanted to add, of course, the Cold War situation was one, and a real war situation is a different one. And I personally, this time I'm really talking personally, you know, I'm not Secretary of State, I can't just give my <laughs> own opinion. <laughs> so I, I think uh, with situations becoming what they are, there are moments when you really have to think and see what to do. So what I said, uh, we, we just, I mean, things may happen in the world that may force us to try to interrupt some things and some others. But obviously, as long as we can uh, keep uh, the communications, then indeed we are there to help when things get better. But if things get terribly, terribly bad, then we have to reconsider. Thanks a lot. So we slowly come to the end. One wish, all of you, I got, you know, what's the wish, Phil, for SK very briefly, you know? Five years, ten years from now. Well, ten, ten years from now, to be producing wonderful science. I think it's been a long journey from the late 1980s, early 1990s, from the uh, scientists sitting around at, at meetings, drinking coffee, drinking beer and wine, thinking grand thoughts, and now we're building what they yeah. thought about. Thanks and a lot. Looking forward to it producing yeah. science. Thanks a lot, Phil. Michel, what's in for Swiss industry in uh, you know, two years, three years? So what, what's, what's your wish? Very brief. Well, that we get access to contracts and uh, that's... that's <laughs> uh, so so that's you are in presence you know, of the right people, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll talk on coffee afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to increase still, right? So it would be nice to increase still the Swiss contribution. Yeah. Jean-Paul, Swiss community. Yeah, it's I, growing. It's growing. I think we have lots of young students and postdocs that are, you know, engaged now in SKO. So they're starting to work on the science and they're 
ready to you know grab what's SKU data that will come and make discoveries. I think you know that's that's what is for Switzerland here. Uh, Martin, please. Well, first I would like to thank actually the scientists that had the long view, right? What you exactly said, and, and, and this is fantastic about science, is that people dedicate their lives to think about problems where maybe next generation will actually really benefit from it, right? Uh, you know, the discovery of exoplanets was exactly an example like this, where a bunch of people just believed somebody someday would actually see exoplanets. It happens that they saw them, right? Which was good for their Nobel Prize. Uh, so uh, I, I would really like to, think, to thank everybody that participated because unless you have the passion to do it, you know, it's not going to happen. That's number one. N number two, I hope that the methods people will help you find you know, new science, get great results, and you know, establish you know, m stronger collaborations, also international collaborations, of which uh, this is a beautiful example. Uh, thanks, Martin. Catherine, Chair of the Council. Well, since I've already talked a lot, I will be do a little a côté, because yep. you talked about South Africa, yep. and there's a comment I wanted to make. Yep, please. Uh, they have recently created a prize for young women working in astronomy, yep. uh, young women and uh, less young women, two prizes. <laughs> and, uh, so, and they have asked me to be part of the jury, yep. so I could see the people that were presented, and especially the young ones, a large part of them were prepared through Meerkat, through the preparation of SKA. Some will stay in SKA, some went to other subjects. Yep. But I can tell you that in South Africa already, they are doing a lot to bring the young yeah. South Africans, in particular the women, up to date. Yep. And you know, from all colors and all, yep. <laughs> uh, to really learn and get strong uh, in science and yes. technology. Thanks a lot. So I'm extremely impressed. Yep. Martina Hirayama, your state secretary will be responsible for, you know, monitoring that everything <laughs> goes well. So what's your wish here? So uh, until uh, 2030, <laughs> everything is set. So, <laughs> so uh, my wish, uh, of course, revolutionary um, advances in science uh, to foster innovation and this in an open international corporation. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Well, you heard that, right? So thanks a lot to panelists. So thanks a lot for coming. Uh, big applause, please. So this brings us to the end of uh, actually this event. And so before thanking some, some people, let me just cite, and actually there was a press release out uh, with a video, so you're happy to, you know, to, to, to see that. But actually, I would like to quote what actually Phil Diamond, you have a quote in that press release, and if you allow, you know, I would like to read it, kind of a concluding remark. So what, what uh, Phil is saying in that press release is, it's only fitting that a country where physicist Albert Einstein went to university and developed his general theory of rel relativity should become a member of the S SK Observatory. Shortly, we will have built one of the most sophisticated instruments yet to test whether this theory still holds, more than a century after Einstein published it. And I, I guess that's really, so thanks a lot for this quote. You can read it in the press release, so please do so. So let me thank, so first of all, the panelists for coming, uh, the SK delegation, uh, you know, coming from Manchester all the way to Switzerland, so thanks a lot for this. I'm grateful very much to President Suisse, the House of Switzerland, you know, to host today our event here in, in, in Davos and as well the audience which uh, being online. Thanks to the people behind the scenes. So there were many people at EPFL, uh, you know, making that event uh, possible. And we had as well many people here, you know, in the House of Switzerland. So thanks a lot as well, uh, all of you, you know, that uh, this event could make uh, possible here. So. Let me close with saying au revoir, auf Wiedersehen, arrivederci, adia, which is Romansh. I don't speak Romansh, but <laughs> it's Romansh. And goodbye. Thanks a lot for attending. Uh, there's still, if there's press around, there's still time actually, you know, to contact some of the panelists. There is a lot of still buffet and drinks, so just have a talk over the buffet and uh, we 
can be here for, I guess, probably another half an hour or so. Right? Thanks a lot for attending. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks.